much for the invitation and uh, the introduction. Um, and it's my pleasure to be in this seminar. Um, so today I'll be speaking about local smoothing for the wave equation in two plus one dimensions. Well, uh, I, pr I probably um, talked about this in a few other occasions. So my apologies if you've been at this talk and uh, if you've been at this talk, then I would appreciate your questions at any time. So we can probably have some um, new conversations and uh, like for everyone, like uh, feel free to ask questions anytime um, and feel free to interrupt me. Um, so um, my here's my plan. So I'll first talk about the problem and uh, a little bit of history. And then we will talk about um, an important technique when people study this problem um, called decoupling and the relationship of the problem with decoupling. And um, finally, um, actually I'm going to, I plan to speak uh, a little bit or, or quite a bit on ideas in the proof. Um, so uh, especially in the third part, probably that will take half of the talk. Um, if you have questions, then I will be happy to answer them. Okay. So um, the local smoothing problem um, oops, um, is shown as here. Um, so uh, we consider a quite simple equation, which is the free wave equation. That means you just have the box operator acting on u in r to the n plus one, and you assume the box operator vanishes. So utt equals to Laplacian x of u, x is n-dimensional. And uh, you prescribe some initial data. So this is uh, of second order in t. Um, so you prescribe u and ut at t equals to zero. And for simplicity, we assume u of t equals to zero at time zero. So as you can see in my first remark, um, there's an entirely similar story or problem if you assume generally u of t at t equals to zero is some g tilde, but uh, we'll just assume it's zero uh, for this talk. And you also assume u at t equals to zero is uh, some function g. And um, so uh, for a function, we can talk about its magnitude and one very um, often used um, way to describe how big a function is, is the LP norm. So a uh, seemingly natural, natural question would be, if you assume G um, the initial U at T equals to zero is in LP, that means LP of Rn, um, is it always true that um, if you look at the wave at time one or any fixed time you like, uh, it's also in LP. Um, so if, um, if it's also in LP or if it blows up. Uh, and uh, if it blows up in LP, then you can ask how many LP derivatives it might lose. So those are very natural questions, LP based questions. And um, um, Actually, this is true for p equals to two because by Plancherel, uh, you can understand it as, as some sort of a conservation law, but uh, Plancherel, it's really easy to give it. Um, and, uh, um, but if p is not equal to two, then um, this is not true. Uh, for example, when um, I think we will only consider p bigger than two in this talk, um, the dual exponent p less than two and bigger than one is also interesting, but we will not talk about it. Um, and when p is bigger than two, um, if you start with g in LP, you don't necessarily have to have um, the u at time one is also in LP. So actually there's a quite um, elementary, uh, I shouldn't say elementary, there's a quite uh, intuitive counter example that uh, you can imagine there's a wave concentrating towards a point and then um, it completely concentrates at the point uh, when time equals to one. So this wouldn't blow up the LP2 norm, but uh, if you go above two, it would immediately blow up all the LP norms for P bigger than two. So uh, this is uh, also an interesting phenomenon. Um, and um, um, in particular, you, you can uh, talk about the derivatives um, it might lose. And uh, for the above example, if you do a little computation, you'll see that um, you can you can lose n minus one um, times one half minus one over p many derivatives. Uh, and this is actually 
the best. So actually, uh, Ziegler, Salk, and Stein, Stein, they proved that it's possible to lose this many derivatives, and their setting is more general in actually in the Fourier integral operator setting. Um, but it's also a classical result that you can lose at most this many derivatives, um, which was proved by Perot and also Miyashi. Um, so this is um, uh, the classical, uh, this is the classical results about this um, question. And there's an interesting phenomenon we'll be getting to. Um, so as before, you can see that when P is bigger than two, if you look at a fixed time estimate, you might lose LP derivatives as, as long as you move away from L2. But if you average on a local time interval, then this might change. So let's see our time interval is between one and two. So I'm not cheating, I'm not at time equals to zero. Then um, actually Sog had this uh, observation and made this conjecture in 1991 that um, actually when P is equal to two N over N minus one, or actually for every P less than it and bigger than two, if U solves um, our free wave equation with U of T at time equals to zero vanishing, then you have this very simple um, inequality. So the LP norm of U, um, when you average in a time interval, in a time window between one and two, um, you will see that it doesn't lose derivatives or almost doesn't lose derivatives. So it's less than um, the sublet norm, W epsilon P of G. Uh, in Rn. So remember G is um, U of T, uh, sorry, G is U at T equals to zero. So it's the function we start with. Um, so W epsilon P is the Soblex um, norm or, or um, Soblex space, um, if you write it as a space. So um, in two, I'm not going to define it. You can define it by little Pele. Um, so it consists of functions in LP with epsilon many LP derivatives. So this means that for every epsilon, um, sorry, what's that question? Okay, uh, probably not. Okay, so uh, so um, we're, we were at the subject space and um, this can be defined by little Pele and um, W epsilon P is actually the space with epsilon many LP derivatives. So, if you um, if you have this inequality, then this means if you average over the time window one two, you lose almost zero derivative. So this is very strong uh, conjecture, and if you want to understand it intuitively, then this um, roughly means the propagator of the wave equation is almost bounded on LP. Remarkably, when p bigger than two and less than two n over n minus one. Um, if one averages locally in time. So that's um, why you have the local in the name of this conjecture. And smoothing means that if you average, then you get, you get, you get smoother. So this is um, um, Sock's local smoothing conjecture. And we'll be talking about uh, one joint work. Actually, I should have said it in the beginning with uh, Larry Goose and Hong Wang, which resolves it in the two dimensional case or two plus one dimensional case. So one plus one dimension is um, sort of it's very easy. You can basically write down the solutions. And the first interesting case is when n equals to two. And actually we'll be fixing n equals to two for the remainder of um, this talk. And uh, I'm re I rewrote a conjecture. So in this case, remember our previous exponent is two n over n minus one. So in this case it's four and the conjecture is um, shown here. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, when Sog raised this conjecture, um, he already proved some, some lo non-trivial local smoothing. So what do I mean by this? Remember uh, previously um, when, I, when I mentioned fixed time estimates, uh, I guess when in the two dimensional case, um, you can probably lose one quarter many derivatives. And uh, what Sog proved was that if you average between time equals to one and two, you must lose less derivatives than one quarter. So non-trivial local smoothing effect. And then um, shortly after Monkenhoff, Ziegler, and Sock, they proved that um, you can uh, you, you must lose not more than one eighth 
many derivatives. So this is like halfway um, progress, so very remarkable. And then um, it, this was further improved by Tal Vergas by their bilinear method, I guess, and Wolf and Lee. Um, um, and um, very recently, um, joined with uh, Larry Groth and Hong Wang, um, we confirmed this conjecture for n equals to two, uh, which is the conjecture shown above. And um, we'll just be focusing on this conjecture and the proof uh, for today. Okay, so um, I think before going into the proof, um, I, as I mentioned, I'll mention something that's very important in history. So that's known as uh, decoupling introduced by Wolf, a very, very nice idea. And uh, in order to introduce that, um, I probably want to motivate a little bit by raising a slightly different but related problem. So um, for P bigger than four in two plus one dimensions, we'll always focus on two plus one dimensions today. Um, there's also a local smoothing conjecture uh, that's probably in my abstract. So if you start with an LP function, you cannot hope to lose zero derivatives when you average between time equals to one and two because P is uh, very big and, um, and your counterexamples tells you that's impossible. But you can still do better than the fixed time estimate. Uh, remember fixed time estimate is to lose one half times uh, one, uh, sorry, one half minus one over P many derivatives but actually you can do better. And um, Sog also conjecture that you um, almost gain one over P derivatives. So you lose one half minus two over P derivatives instead, um, or almost this many derivatives when you average over the time interval one and two. So um, Wolf actually made progress on this conjecture. And of course, <clears throat> one intuition would be if you can make this uh, progress, progress on this conjecture for sufficiently higher P and then push the P lower and lower. And in the end, uh, getting to P equals to four, then you prove the local smoothing conjecture. So that's one viable uh, route to go along. So then he actually proved this conjecture for P bigger than or equal to 74, a very big number. But probably what's more important is that um, he invented what's known as a decoupling or uh, more technically, if you've seen decoupling, little LP, capital LP decoupling uh, around 2000 to prove <coughs> this uh, case P when P bigger than or equal to 74. So uh, we'll be briefly, mention, um, briefly mentioning what Wolf's result is. Um, and um, as you can see, if you do, so this, this uh, free will equation is a very simple equation. Um, and um, you can study it very well by Fourier transform because when you do Fourier transform, um, those der derivatives will become multiplications. And <clears throat> if you do the Fourier, the time space Fourier transform to u, you will see that um, the condition that u solves the wave equation, the free wave equation, is equivalent to the Fourier transform of u supporting um, the cone um, on a certain cone corresponding to the speed of the light, uh, which is one in our case. So you can imagine that if you do little Pele to our U, which is natural because you have sublet spaces, um, then you have, the, you have to deal with the truncated cone. You probably have to deal with functions supported on tr the truncated cones. So that is our setup. Um, so we take um, a truncated cone around um, at the constant scale. So we take this gamma to be, um, so I'll use C to denote the frequency variables when you do the Fourier transform. So um, gamma, we take it to be the absolute value of uh, C3 equals to the absolute value of C1, C2, and one less than C3 less than two. So this is the truncated cone. And we partition it into sectors of a perturbed capital R to the minus one half for some large parameter R. Hopefully the row of R will be clear soon but R is a very large number. You can imagine it's maybe 10,000 or 10 to the 10. Um, so I have a picture on the next slide. So let me go to the next slide to show you what this means. So you have the truncated cone here and uh, theta is one sector, uh, the shaded area. It has a, per a pressure R to the minus one half. So um, 
for example, the bottom arc uh, has length about r to the minus one half. So this is the setup. Uh, let's go back to the previous slide to finish what I had in there. Okay, so um, Wolf's uh, idea for decoupling is that um, if you have F um, whose Fourier support is on gamma, then um, as analysis, we want to decompose this F. So uh, Wolf considered the decomposition F equals to the sum of F theta, where each F theta satisfied the following. If you do the Fourier transform of F theta, that's the restriction of the Fourier transform of F on theta. So remember theta is a sector. So you decompose in the Fourier space, and then you do the Fourier inverse back to decompose F into pieces. Um, and uh, Wolf um, actually proved an inequality that is very, very useful. Uh, that's also correct. Um, I'll state it, I state it in the next slide. So this is known as uh, decoupling. Uh, by the way, uh, I think uh, Hong Wang was once here, uh, spoke about decoupling. And uh, um, so uh, you can probably uh, talk to her or look at um, her talk to know more about decoupling. Um, so this is the theorem of Wolf anyway. Uh, for p bigger than or equal to 74, you have this uh, inequality. The LP norm of f is bounded by the sum of f theta LP norm to the piece power raised to the one over piece power times some certain factor. So you see this one half minus two over p again here. You can imagine it has to do with the local smoothing problem. Um, so indeed it has. Um, and um, so this inequality, uh, maybe maybe I'll just uh, say a little bit about the history first. Um, so actually, um, there's a recent breakthrough by Berg and Demeter uh, that uh, they prove this inequality is also true for p bigger than or equal to six. So this is very remarkable because you uh, lower the uh, threshold uh, tremendously. Um, there has been intermediate uh, like progress too. Um, but uh, this p bigger than or equal to six is optimal. Um, so that's one bad thing about this kind of approach um, because um, as you can see in the second item, uh, as already noticed by Wolf, that this theorem implies the LP local smoothing for p bigger than 74 or bigger than or equal to six in Berg and Demeter's case. Um, so this is a very, very useful inequality when you prove local smoothing. But um, this theorem must fail for p less than six, very unfortunately. Uh, but we really wanted to prove local smoothing estimates for p bigger than six. Um, is there a question? Bigger than four, sorry. Um, is there a question? Uh, okay. No, no, right. no. Okay, you can get yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're left with the range uh, four less than or equal to p less than six that cannot be covered by decoupling because decoupling uh, fails for p less than six. There are counter examples showing that this inequality cannot hold anymore. Um, so this is very bad. Um, and uh, uh, maybe before I leave this uh, slide, one more comment about decoupling. Uh, that is, uh, you look at this inequality, if you work with it for a long time, you probably will realize that this is a very clever way to um, write inequalities because it's like some it's like some orthogonality, something between orthogonality and triangle inequality. So this little LP, um, L, big LP norms really uh, simplify things a lot. And then you can, for example, induct on scales uh, with this kind of inequalities, uh, just like um, with the triangle inequality, if you have um, the norm of one function is less than the other two, and then you can write one of the other two less than, uh, um, again, a sum of uh, yet another two, then you have the, in the initial function, um, the norm of the initial function less than the sum of the three functions. So this is very convenient to pass this uh, inequalities along into, finer and finer decompositions. So um, this is a very clever way to write inequalities. But uh, unfortunately, um, we, we would like to stay comfortable with it, uh, but it doesn't cover a certain range of the conjecture. So uh, this is also um, why we initially are interested 
in uh, the local smoothing conjecture, uh, even after this recent progress of um, decoupling. Okay, so I'll mention a little bit about uh, another similar looking result that we proved in our paper, but probably you will not go in uh, there uh, too deep. So we were actually able to prove a slightly different result. Um, previously, we were looking at uh, little LP, big LP estimates, but here, uh, we're looking at the so-called square function estimate, where you first take a little l2 pointwisely in the space, and then take the big L4. So this is a, a unfriendlier. This is an unfriendlier inequality, but um, it's useful in the case that, in the sense that it implies the local smoothing for p equals to four. So joined uh, with Larry uh, and Home, we were able to prove this theorem uh, that says. Um, if you have, um, so if again, if you have the Fourier support of F on the truncated cone, then the L4 norm of F is less than um, some, so remember we had this R, uh, which um, controls the aperture of the CDAS. So um, if you take the square function, sum over F CDAS square raised to one half, and then take the L4 norm, um, you will have, this can control the L4 norm of the original function F, um, um, modulo of factor of r to the epsilon. So this implies uh, the local smoothing conjecture for p equals to four. So that's a very good thing. And um, one very curious thing about our proof is that actually our proof does not rely on decoupling at all, but um, it was inspired by, a lot by uh, Bergen and Demeter's proof of the decoupling conjecture. Uh, hopefully this will be become clearer when I um, go further. Uh, but um, we actually, our methods were able to prove this square function estimate, which implies local smoothing, uh, but maybe I'll focus on local smoothing um, for today. So I think maybe next slide is on the proof already, yes. So before I go into the proof, um, do, um, does anyone have any questions um, on what I've talked about so far? Um. Yeah, uh, I have yeah. a question. Um, can you uh, can you improve uh, R epsilon to play this um, by the low low risk of R some power? Um, okay, yeah, that, that's a great question. So the question is that can you, for example, replace this R to the epsilon by something smaller like uh, log logarithms? Uh, yeah. I would say that uh, with the our current techniques it feels difficult to remove this um, R to the epsilon, uh, but um, I, I don't know, like uh, it, might be, it might be possible. Uh, so, um, if you, uh, so if you see the recent work with, uh, uh, sorry, if you see the recent work by um, Guth and Wang with uh, Dominic Modak, um, they, actually I, I proved, one, yeah. they actually improved the decoupling, L6 decoupling. Uh, by having a power of log. So that's a remarkable work uh, that, that was open for uh, many years. Yeah. Uh, but for, for here, um, I'm not really sure. So I, I haven't thought too much about that. But uh, uh, for sure, I think for L4, you cannot um, remove this R to the epsilon completely. You have to blow up, but uh, improving it uh, is a good question. Um, I'm not so sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, okay. Because uh, last time I tried to to understand uh, um, the the result of Zinbuken uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I can uh, uh, try yeah I tried to compute uh, the cast symbol of Zinbuken uh, and then I obtain uh, uh, play LP by with LP yeah mm -hmm. I have okay I will uh, we can discuss later okay. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah, thanks. Okay, maybe um, let me move on to talk about the proof for the re remainder um, of this talk. Um, so I was explaining ideas in the proof um, and um, the first idea, um, I wouldn't spend too much time on it, but it's uh, kind of uh, very well known in this kind of problems which is uh, known as localization. So um, for, the, 
for either the local smoothing estimate or the square function estimate, you're looking at the L4 norm on an infinite, uh, infinite domain, which goes to infinity. And um, if this makes you uncomfortable, um, then you can try to adjust the problem a little bit to make your left-hand side always bounded. So this technique is known as the localization. Um, so I'll just mention what's, uh, what you have after the reduction. Um, so you can, you can do, um, so you have the uncertainty principle that I'll probably also be talking about. But um, if you have, if, if you can blur out the Fourier transform by a little bit, then um, you can localize your function to a ball. That's the moral um, spirit of this kind of techniques. So um, we have our gamma to be the truncated cone. And we'll talk about gamma of one over R. So this is the one over R neighborhood of gamma. And you will see the reason of this one over R um, on the bottom of this slide. So I'll get there soon. Um, and um, now let's change our setup a little bit. Let's assume the support of the Fourier uh, transform of F is actually in gamma of one over R. So this is the one, one of our neighborhood of gamma and we'll stick to uh, this new setup. And um, we will try to prove the following inequality where you can see the left-hand side is already uh, localized. So uh, one of R times the L4 norm of F over a ball of radius R in uh, two plus one dimensional space to the fourth power. You want to prove this is less than R to the epsilon times the initial um, L4 norm raised to the fourth power. So you can see the left-hand side is also some average over a time interval. Uh, you have a um, capital R instead of a window one, two. That's because you do a little rescaling to rescale the frequency back to one and then the physical variable um, up to the scale R. So this is a standard uh, thing to do. And we will focus, so you can understand this inequality as roughly with the same difficulty as the local smoothing estimate and we'll be proving, we'll aim at proving such an inequality. Um, so in this setting, we also change the meaning of theta to its convex hull, or it's one of our neighborhood. So you, you, you uh, remember theta has a pressure r to the minus one half. And uh, by differential geometry, you see that the convex hull of theta is approximately, it's one of our neighborhood. So um, by, for example, John's ellipsoid theorem, you know every convex body is basically an ellipsoid or a rectangular box. So roughly a box in our case of dimensions one by r to the minus one half by r inverse. So this is uh, the intuition. I probably drew it somewhere. Um, let me see if I, um, yeah, so may maybe, maybe I didn't draw it, but uh, um, I think I have some picture here, which can visualize um, some sort of things. Um, our theta, <clears throat> so I only drew the shaded cap here. It's a shaded sector, but it's not actually a box. Um, and F is the sum of F theta as before. Um, so we can decompose um, F theta further into pieces that localize further in the physical space. So F theta, remember previously, it lo only localizes to theta in the frequency space, meaning that its frequency lies in theta. But we can also localize it in the physical space, at least morally, as long as it doesn't violate the uncertainty principle. Um, I guess this kind of observation was um, first uh, uh, was already known to Pfefferman and Bergen actually made use of this uh, observation a lot. Um, so this is now known as the wave packet decomposition, which is also very useful in Fourier restriction type problems uh, such as this one. Um, so further I decompose, as you can see below, F to be the sum of F theta, which is in turn a sum of F theta V. So each F theta is a sum of F theta Vs. And F theta V is known as a wave packet which has a good property that um, in the frequency space, it's also supported in theta or three theta. 
but physically it's supported essentially in another box that has the dimensions and directions due to theta so that you don't violate the uncertainty principle. So it's supported in this case in T theta V, that's a rectangular box that's due to theta and has dimensions as I written here, one by R to the one half by R. So um, the dual dimensions to the dimensions of theta. And each F theta V absolute value, um, you can pretend it's a constant on T theta V and we will call it the magnitude of this function. Uh, okay, so this is um, the decomposition and we'll just describe this, this decomposition without uh, proving it. Actually, we don't need to use the full power in this project, but it's a good intuition to have when you start to think about um, this kind of problems. Um, so you decompose your F into localized wave packets. And then you can think about how wave packets interact. And um, the experience is, it, it's just, you, you just need to know the locally constant property. And that when you add up wave packets, they have certain L2 orthogonalities. And then you just play with the geometric positions and interactions. Uh, of the support of the essential support of the wave packets. That's the that's that's a good way to think about uh, a lot of this kind of problems. Okay, so actually, I have I have a picture here that shows you what a wave packet or the essential support of a wave packet is really like. So those are rectangles that are due to status. So um, those are boxes going along the light cone in the physical space that uh, I drew here. Um, so a, a red box is one possible support of the wave packets. Okay. Um, and um, with the help of this, one can start to think about how to estimate the L4 norm of F or B of R or above radius R. So of course, if one wave packet is away from it, then it doesn't contribute much one can probably ignore that, at least in the first stage of uh, thinking. Uh, but um, all the relevant wave packets are in a ball of radius R, which might overlap in some unexpected way. So you can, you can probably expect that there's a, an underlying geometric problem. Um, so actually, this is the start of our proof that um, we thought about some simple cases and try to get a good bound of the L4 norm of F uh, raised to the fourth power, some more familiar bound to say uh, Fourier analysis. Um, so we began, we began to do some case studies. And um, one very natural way to do this is that you assume there are only N wave packets and each wave packet has magnitude one. That means um, the F value of this wave packet on its essential support, you can assume it's roughly one. So that's just a normalization. Then what is a good upper bound of the L4 norm of F on BR raised to the fourth power? Um, so we looked at a few cases and tried to come up with a uh, um, um, good bound that also seems more provable. So the first example is very simple. We just look at the separated wave packets case where the wave packets have separated supports, then um, a simple computation shows that the L4 normal raised to the fourth power is just n times uh, the L4 norm of one single wave packet, which is R to the three halves in this case. So we recorded that. And there's another very often used example, which is a random example. So if you move the wave packets around in the ball of radius R and then give them random signs and random positions, um, then you would expect square root cancellation at each point and each point being hit by the same number of uh, points. So uh, let's assume M bigger than R to the three halves so that the total volume of the supports is bigger than R cubed so that each point you expect it to be hit by at least one wave packet. Then um, what's the way to compute the L4 to the fourth power? Um, as you can see on the bottom, 
uh, you, you take R cubed, which is, which is the volume of the R ball, and then times um, the value at each point, you expect raised to the fourth power. So what's the value? Each point is hit by n times r to the minus three halves many wave packets. At least that's what you expect. And you expect to have a square root cancellation. So raised to one half and then raised to the fourth power because you're taking the L4 norm to the fourth power. So this gets you um, n square. So that's some number. Uh, we just, uh, again, recorded this number. And um, so we now have two examples that gives uh, different bounds. You can check they don't uh, get better than um, each other uh, all of the time. So you want to make a conjecture that uh, takes both into account. Um, so again, we ask this question and based on the previous two examples, it's very tempting to guess. You have the alpha norm to the fourth power less than, so you always allow an R to the epsilon room and then times n times r to the three halves plus n squared. So this is um, a very tempting conjecture, but it turns out that there are a third kind of interesting examples that um, shows that this conjecture must be wrong. We must add more things on the right-hand side. So what is the third kind of examples that we found? It's also very natural. So it's known as um, a fat plank example. So actually in this example, we don't take wave packets of all possible directions. We just take wave packets coming from sectors that are really, really close. And then naturally um, they can be contained in something uh, that we call a fat plank. So this is a rectangular box along the direction of the light cone of dimensions r by rs by rs square, where s is something, anything, any say dyadic number between r to the minus one half and one. So this is a fat plank. And it's possible for all the wave packets to be in this fat plank. Um, so you do the same computation. You will see the alpha norm um, for a random example with random positions and signs in, inside this plank to be s to the minus three n squared. So this is easily seen to be bigger than n squared. So uh, that n squared term is not good. And also sometimes it's also bigger than this n times r to the three halves. So it can be bigger than both sides in our naive conjecture that we had before. So we must raise a different conjecture that takes this case also into account. Um, and we did that and fortunately, um, when we try to prove that conjecture, we succeeded. So that means there are essentially no other uh, bad counterexamples. So how do we form that conjecture? Well, we take all the three into account. And for example, you can notice that in this fat plank example, when S equals to one, this is back to our previous uh, example two, because everything is in uh, a ball in that case, and you can move them randomly. And when S is equal to R to the minus one half, we have, we go back, to, we're back to the one wave packet case, which is like the, the first example. So um, we actually um, have an example that um, has special specializes to uh, both previous examples. So that, that's very nice. And um, so, so we can realize this kind of fat plants are really crucial in um, this problem. And uh, we made a conjecture that uh, sort of highlights the roles of these um, fat planks. So the conjecture might be a little technical. I'll try to explain it. Um, but this is the conjecture that uh, is essentially true and essentially proved in our paper. Um, so we can assume S to be dyadic between R to the minus one half and one. And um, basically we look at all the fat planks inside the, uh, ball of, our ball of radius R. So all the fat planks can be described as U of tau. So that's in the third line of this uh, slide. Um, U, uh, so um, actually we decompose gamma of one of R into sectors of larger aperture, aperture being S and uh, I call those tau. For each tau, I take all the thetas and um, 
all the theta duals. And I take the convex hull of all the theta duals to be a fat plant centered at the origin. And then I move that fat plant around. So the fat plant U tau has dimensions R by RS by RS squared. And for each U tau, um, you can tile uh, this B of R by translations of that fat plant, as I mentioned before, uh, U. And for each U, um, I have a function F of U to be the sum of all wave packets that are essentially supported on U. So I sort of look at this fat plank and all the wave packets in it as uh, a whole. But then we have a conjecture. We sort of realize that all the previous right-hand sides that we have for examples are some L2 norm raised to the fourth power uh, based on this uh, fat planks and their geometry. So we form a conjecture that the L4 norm of F, again, of B of R raised to the fourth power is less than the sum over all S, which is a mild sum because you have dyadic numbers and you um, lose only a log considering different S. And then you sum over all the U's, with, which is a, a translation of some U of tau. So some fat plant. So meaning that you sum over all the U's that are some fat plant of dimension R by R to the uh, R times S by R times S squared. And then you have something that imitates the L4 norm, but it's actually L2 based. So the volume of U inverse times F U L2 raised to the fourth power. So this is morally our conjecture. If you look at our paper, um, for technical reasons, we replaced F U by something else. But um, in when, when we do research, we morally think they're the same. So this is the moral conjecture that we have and we were able to prove. Okay, I probably only have 10 minutes. So probably I'll just choose some highlights uh, when we prove this conjecture. Uh, okay, so let's try to move on. Um, okay, so the first idea um, proving this conjecture, um, so in the, as you can see in the remaining time, we'll explain a little bit about how we prove this conjecture. And the first idea is induction on scales. So I'll just explain what induction on scales is. Uh, you're trying to prove some conjecture that depends on some parameter S. And um, induct, induction on scales means that you ask yourself, do you know, do you know this conjecture? Oh, sorry, based on some based on some parameter R, capital R. So induction on scales means that you ask yourself, do you know anything if you assume we know this already for little r less than say capital R over two. So this is an often used trick uh, by us. And actually Wolf is a master of this trick. Um, and um, actually it does help because uh, the cone has a certain symmetry called um, the Lorentz rescaling. You can, um, <clears throat> you can rescale part of the cone to um, the whole of the cone and uh, probably I'll omit the technical details, uh, but I'll just mention that this is an important, <clears throat> important um, technology when you prove such a conjecture depending on this capital R, so known as induction on scales. And um, so induction on scales inspired us to define some uh, quantity that depends on two parameters instead of one. So, uh, we have this quantity S little r capital R. And the goal is to prove S of one capital R less than R to the epsilon in, in this language. So maybe uh, I can probably provide um, these slides uh, afterwards, but uh, I'll just mention that we have some important quantity S little r capital R in the induction of scales. And the goal is to prove S one capital R less than R to the epsilon. Um, and induction of scales tells us what's on the bottom. So that's a relation between S little r capital R for certain little r's and capital R's. So maybe I'll just move to the next slide to explain it. So in this slide, you, you, don't, you don't need to know the definition of S little r capital R, but this is a purely uh, mathematical game that you can play. 
So we want to show that S1 capital R less than R to the epsilon. And we know the second ingredient uh, that S of little r1, little r3 less than log of r2 times S of little r1, little r2 times the maximum of uh, certain capital S functions. And the crucial thing is that, um, so you have an iterative machine based on this. And then um, you, you, you usually try to, you usually need some, um, some input to put into this machine. And hopefully this machine can upgrade everything to what you need to this S1 capital R less than R to the epsilon. So we sort of figured out some um, reachable inputs. And the first input is actually in the third item that if you look at S of capital R to the one half and capital R, then this is friendlier to deal with. So actually you can exploit orthogonality and uh, the first crucial ingre ingredient that we had was that we prove S of little r1 and capital R less than one, when capital R to the one half less than little r1 less than capital R. And this was proved very non-trivially by new techniques in incidence geometry that I'll probably mention. And there's, so if you, um, if you play with this machine, you will see that uh, once you have this bound of S of capital R to one half capital R, then you just need to show this um, S one capital K less than K to the epsilon. And then you just plug in these two ingredients to this machine and the machine will upgrade both to this S one R less than R to the epsilon. So that's, um, that's a very nice thing that we found we need the, these two ingredients. And um, um, we prove these two ingredients, which uh, in the end gives S1 R less than R to the epsilon. So maybe um, I'll focus more on the first ingredient. <clears throat> so I'll probably omit what's the, in the second ingredient. Um, okay, so the first ingredient, um, actually we can use orthogonality of wave packets, L2 orthogonality and um, Actually, we morally reduce it to an incidence theorem, which we proved. So what is this uh, incidence theorem? Um, we described it into an incidence theorem, but we didn't prove this exactly. We essentially proved it. So that's why I said essentially in our paper. So you can see that uh, so this is a theorem completely combinatorial. Assuming you have a collection of one by r to the one half by r plants with their directions along the light cone, then if you integrate on br of sum of the characteristic functions squared, you can imagine this L2 norm corresponds to some L4 norm of functions because of the row of planter L. And then you can see a similar sum on the right-hand side that, so what is this sum? You have similar sums over s, over um, taus, over u's, but this time you have an L1 norm that imitates the L2 norm. So volume of U inverse times the integral of U of one over T that, that's actually a, a kind of average of the sum of uh, the characteristic function of T's where T is, uh, lies essentially in this larger fat plant U and then squared. So you're bounding the L2 norm on the left hand side by a bunch of uh, L1 norm squared at different scales on the right hand side. So this is, um, this looks like a reverse holder inequality, but turns out to be true and um, very powerful. So this is an incident theorem that we proved. And um, it is one, <clears throat> it's the ingredient that we can bound as capital R to the one half and capital R. And I just have a bunch of remarks about this theorem. So you can try to first prove this theorem for the parabola. There's a natural analog rather than for the cone. Um, and that analog can be proved elementarily. But one remarkable thing is that um, this theorem as elementary as it seems, uh, we, we didn't find an elementary proof to it. So in three dimensions, in, in the cone setting, it becomes more difficult. And we only used uh, recent developments um, 
in geometric measure theory and also in the work of my collaborators. So by Oppenheim, Wynn, and uh, Gus Solomon Wang and Dempel Gus Wang. So they develop a method of proof of proving incidence theorems by uh, viewing this. So you saw you get rid of the oscillations, but uh, they tell you, no, like let's go back to the oscillate, go back to the Fourier transform. So let's use uh, one of uh, a, a smooth function adapted to T to replace this characteristic function of T. And then you look at the sum of the smooth adaptations and then look at the Fourier transform and then you decompose it into high frequency and low frequency parts. Um, so this is a technique of proving incidence uh, theorems that eventually worked in um, our uh, paper or project. Um, and uh, I'll say that this is highly non-trivial even based on this method and the ge geometry of the cone is used in, in an essential way. So that's uh, that's one remark. I, uh, those are the remarks I have for this S one half uh, R to one half R. And finally, maybe I'll just say a word about the second ingredient that I um, don't have time to. Um, so I just say that we actually prove something else uh, that's um, strong enough as a replacement of the second ingredient. And I should say that. Um, this follows from some estimates of the parabola rather than uh, for the cone. And uh, we basically look at the shortened cone and um, see that it resembles the parabola in many ways. Um, and then we use what, what we know about the parabola to deduce the second ingredient. So as you can see that similar tricks we're using in bergen dempter's proof of the decoupling for the cone already. And also Pramani and Ziger also had a trick of this kind. So I think I'm out of time. So I'll just stop here and thank you so much for the attention.